Good morning and uh, welcome to the 13th meeting of the 2016 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Um, we have apologies from Claudia Beamish. And can I welcome Edward Mountain, the convener of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, uh, who is also that committee's reporter in relation to the appointment of the Tenant Farming Commissioner. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone present to ensure their mobile phones are on silent for the duration of the meeting. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. Uh, that concerns items three and four. Uh, are members agreed to take those items in private? Agreed. We are agreed. Uh, agenda item two is, covers the appointment of the Scottish Land Commissioners and the Tenant Farming Commissioner. Um, the committee will hear firstly from the nominee for the Tenant Farming Commissioner, uh, Bob McIntosh, who will then be joined by the five proposed Scottish Land Commissioners to allow a discussion with the group as a whole. Uh, good morning, Bob. Good Welcome morning. to the committee. Um, we're going to um, move on to questions right away. So I'll begin. Can I ask you what specific farming experience you feel you bring to the role of Tenant Farming Commissioner? Yeah, I guess I could answer that in, in several ways. I, I was a hands-on, though part-time farmer for about 15 years in a, a livestock farm in Northumberland. We had about 500 breeding ewes and 20 suckler cows. I was working full-time at the time, but I spent all my holidays and weekends as a very much a hands-on farmer. So I had a real immersion in the farming system at that time. Uh, the first two years of that were as tenants of the farm and, and laterally as owners. And then in my career with the Forestry Commission, I've had various land management roles. I was at one time responsible for the whole of the Forestry Commission estate across the whole of Great Britain, about 1.3 million hectares. A lot of that land was not forest, so I had a lot of immersion in dealing with tenants and tenancies of all different types, agriculture and otherwise. Um, one of my roles in the Forestry Commission, I think, was to encourage and promote the idea of the starter farms. Uh, which I think has been quite a useful development in terms of giving new entrants a start on the farming ladder on land that, uh, and buildings that we would otherwise have sold in the past. So I guess these are the three sort of main areas where I've had involvement with the agriculture sector. Okay, okay. Um, Jenny Goldruth. Morning, Dr McIntosh. Um, I just wanted to ask about whether or not you consider any of your existing rules uh, presently to be a conflict of interest with the rule going forward. Uh, so, for example, I know you were a previous director of uh, Forest and Commission Scotland. Uh, you're currently a board member of the Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and you're a member of the Executive Commission of the Association of Deer Management Groups. Yep. I don't think so. I mean, um, Highlands and Islands obviously has a, a key interest in community development in the Highlands and Islands area and in promoting community ownership, community development, but it's one of the one of the levers that's pulled to deliver that, I suppose. So I think most of the policy stuff comes from outside of High. It's really a delivery agent for community involvement and community ownership. So I don't think there'll be a conflict there. Obviously, if anything came up that was a conflict, I'd have to declare that to either the Land Commission or an HIE board. Can I ask if any of these rules are remunerated? The HIE board is, yes. If I may, what about moving forward? Would the fact that you are the Tenant Farming Commissioner influence some other posts that you might take up? Would you f feel that you would be very careful about any roles you took on in future? Absolutely. And uh, I'm supposed to be retired, so I don't intend to take on any more <laughs> roles, I can assure you, uh, beyond this one. OK. Um, Kate Forbes. Thank you very much. I wonder if you could expand on how you envisage um, the role practically going forward, particularly building relationships with the numerous stakeholders and perhaps drawing on prior experience with those stakeholders in the past? Yeah, I mean, it, it, in taking forward the role, it's going to be vital that I work closely with the key stakeholder bodies, Tenant Farming Association, Scottish Land and Estates, National Farmers Union, RICS probably as well. Um, what's happened to date in terms of drawing up sort of interim codes has very much been with the involvement of all of these bodies. And that will certainly be the way I would move forward. I mean, we have to move with them. We have to take these bodies along with us as we develop policy and ideas. So I would want to work very closely with them. I've, I've dealt with most of them in the past in previous roles in various different ways. Um, so I know most of the individuals involved, and I think they know me. Do you think your um, 
lack of experience, although in a practical sense, with regard to farming, is a disadvantage in any way? Well, I guess it might be, but I'm, I mean, I'm supposed to come to this as a neutral. You know, so in a way, I guess where I'm coming from helps that, that I haven't, I'm not a dyed-in-the-wool tenant or landlord. Uh, I do come from a reasonably neutral perspective. But I have had a career that's a lot of involvement in land use and land management issues. So a lot of the issues that are around I am aware of, I think, and have had some experience of. Okay. Edward Mountain. Convener, thank you. Uh, I'd like to make a declaration before I ask uh, Bob any questions, if I may. I am a partner in a farming business, and uh, for, for information, I worked as a surveyor for the last 15 years looking after uh, farms and estates. So all of that is declared in my register of interest, if, if, if anyone would like to see that. Uh, Bob, if I may, I'd like to ask a little bit about your experience. I, th I believe you said that you'd farmed in Northumberland. Yes. Uh, which is obviously different yep. to, uh, legislation as far as uh, farming in Scotland. Could you tell me your experience in relation to the agricultural holdings legislation? And, and have you done rent reviews? Have you done resumptions? Have you done end of tenancy uh, things? Have you looked at those in Scotland? I haven't been directly involved in these, but obviously in terms of the land that we managed in the Forest Commission, there was a lot of that going on, and some of it floated up to me as Chief Executive to have dealings with, but we did employ quite a lot of land agents and they would have done most of the nuts and bolts of that sort of stuff. So just, just to clarify, you, you had an oversight, but you've never actually immersed yourself as you have in farming by your admission in, in the actual nuts and bolts of the legislation relating to agricultural holdings in Scotland? Not deeply, although in the last few weeks I've been trying to immerse myself. I doubt if anyone could be an expert in the ag holdings legislation actually having had a quick look at it. So I am getting up to speed. Uh, I don't pretend to be an expert in that area. Uh, I will have access to expert advice in that area, though, in the role. That's pretty clear. And I think it's also worth saying, I don't think the technicalities of legislation are not really my role. I mean, if there, if there are issues to be resolved and technical legal issues, that's really for the land court. Can I, can I just uh, one more follow-up, if I may, on that? Is, is having done it for 15 years, I, I, I certainly wouldn't regard myself as an expert. I think I've dipped my toe in the water. Um, so, so I conclude, uh, I agree with what you say, but what slightly worries me is, is, is when you actually go to holdings, if you're, if you're not seen to be actually involved and actually know what you're talking about, it can make things difficult. Do you perceive that that's going to be a problem? Or do you think that people accept your forestry experience gives you a view on agricultural holdings? I, I would accept that it's an area where I have to get up to speed pretty quickly in understanding the legislation in more depth than I do at the moment. I think that's fair. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Mark Roscoe. Um, yeah, morning, Bob. Um, you've obviously got a huge amount of experience in working with different stakeholders and the civil service and forestry commission and other bodies, but what about the real, you know, lived experiences of, of tenant farmers um, in Scotland? Um, that's clearly an area where you perhaps need to, you know, engage a bit more with, with those individual farmers. So, I mean, what, what do you plan to do? How do you plan to do that? Do you con intend to continue working with representative bodies or we actually be out there on the ground meeting, meeting families? Oh, very much hope I'll be out there on the ground. Yes, absolutely. Um, we've still got to resolve how the sort of complaints procedure will work, but I would, I would have hoped that I could intervene in a lot of these issues by speaking to people on the ground and avoid things coming to formal complaints. And that means being out on the ground, talking to people, understanding their issues and trying to you know, reach some sort of middle ground. So, for example, we've got a number of high-profile eviction cases happening at the moment, including one in Aaron. I mean, I wouldn't expect you to comment on those at the moment, but in, in your current role, how would you, in, in the role that you're coming into, how exactly would you engage with an issue like that in terms of understanding the views of, of those parties involved in it? Yeah, well, I think by speaking to all <coughs> sides, as I say, um, it's pretty vital that we understand all sides in these arguments. And I think, you know, in my previous role in Scottish Government, I seem to spend most of my life sitting between people with conflicting objectives and management ideas. So I'm not unfamiliar with that role. And I'm not, not starry-eyed about how easy that'll be. But yes, I mean, I, we'll have to get together with people. It's, most of this role I see is about relationship building. It's not about the technicality so much. It's about trying to create a culture where landlords and tenants can work in an area of mutual respect and understanding in, in, in a fair and reasonable manner. 
and reading the Ag Holdings legislation uh, review, it does seem that's one of the areas where there seem to be a lot of dysfunctional landlord-tenant relationships around. So and that's really about building relationships as much as anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. In, in a wider sense, um, what are the challenges you think you would face in the role? Uh, the TFC role, particularly. Yes. Well, it's a really difficult area. I mean, there are, it's unavoidable that there are inherent tensions in the whole thing between an understandable desire of, of tenants for more security and an understandable desire of landlords for more flexibility. And finding a compromise between these two things is not easy. So it, it's an area that has inbuilt tensions. And, you know, the evidence shows that the area of tenanted land is declining. Perhaps one area where there is a more a greater consensus is around the code of conduct for land agents. Yes. Um, how would you intend to take that forward? Well, one of my duties set by the Act is to produce codes of practice which would apply not just to agents but to tenants and landlords too. So a lot of work's been done on that already by Andrew as the interim the, the um, tenant family advisor. So there's a lot of stuff to build on. These interim guides have got to be turned into formal codes of practice. That has to be done in consultation, again, with these bodies that I'd mentioned before. Uh, and these have got to be published and promoted. And they will hopefully provide the sort of base from which landlords and tenants and agencies will take their guide as to what's reasonable, acceptable behaviour. And then we've got to introduce a, a formal complaints system, which allows people to complain if they think the other party has not abided by the codes of practice. This is all at a very early stage. This is all going to be put in place over the next few months. So that will be one of the, the immediate priorities in the role. OK, you, you've touched on the, uh, the fact that Andrew Thin has been the interim tenant farming commissioner. He's the appointee to become chairman of the Land Commission. Could you talk us through how you envisage the interaction between yourself and the TFC role and the wider uh, Land Commission? How do you think that will work in practice? Well, I'm very pleased to be on the Commission as well as the TFs, having the TFC role, because I think there is a link between the two, and I am interested in the wider issue of the Land Commission, not just the TFC role. So there will be areas of work for the, T for the Commission which don't directly affect the sort of ag holdings area, but there will be areas of my work which have a knock-on effect into wider Land Commission duties. And since I'm on the Commission, I think there should be no difficulty in marrying the two. And there will be things that I'll want to discuss with the whole Land Commission, I guess, in terms of my role. So j just to get this on the record, in, in, a, in practice, will you take the weed and deliver on all the TFC um, roles, or do you have to refer to the Land Commission in any way? By and large, the legislation gives me the role for doing these things, but it does talk in general terms about working with the rest of the Land Commission on, on relevant issues. Right, OK. Uh, Alexander Bonnet, you want to come in? Uh, thank you, Karina. And uh, just for ask my question, just to refer to my register of interests uh, regarding agriculture and forestry holdings. Uh, good morning. Well, um, you touched on a question a bit already when you said that uh, the number of tenant farmers is dropping. <coughs> and, and you're right, over the last 12 years, I think there's been a 20% reduction uh, in the amount of farm available for tenancies. What, what do you see as being the main cause of that? I think there are probably lots of reasons. But I think, again, it's the it's inherent tension between security and um, flexibility, which I guess is, has caused some landlords not to want to rent land because of the fear they may lose it. I mean, like, there's no getting away from that. It must be part of the issue that, that prevents land owners from wanting to rent land. Um, so it is very difficult to get that balance between the rights and responsibilities of a tenant and the rights and responsibilities of the landlord. As I said before, there is an inherent tension there, which is so not it's, easy to resolve. So you, you believe it's the lack of flexibility which has caused the... Well, I'm sure that's just one of the reasons. There are lots of other reasons, I'm sure. Okay. Sorry, just, just to follow up on that, because I think it's disturbing that if you look, there is a, there is a drop-off of, of uh, tenant farms and new entrants in. So you're, you're saying there's tension. Uh, I just wonder if, if, if you could say what your solution is. That is your solution... Uh, a freedom of contract between between landlord and tenant, or, or, or is it a stricture within the legislation of the Agricultural Holdings Act? 
and their limited duration tenancies. Could you give us some? I have no preconceived ideas on that. I mean, clearly the Ag, Ag Holdings Review led to some changes uh, in the legislation in the Land Reform Act, and there some new measures were introduced there. Now, we'll have to see how these bed in. The new modern limited duration tenancy, we don't really know, I think, how successful that's going to be or otherwise. So we'll have to wait and see how these things develop. And in the meantime, as I said, I would really want to sit down with the main bodies get their ideas, their thoughts on it, and work with them to move things forward. But I have to say I have no preconceived ideas at this stage about what the best solutions may be. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I mean, we hear all too often about the tensions and the, the disagreements that exist in the sector. But behind the scenes, there has been some fairly good collaborative working, notably led by David Johnson at Scottish Land and Estates, around things like rent reviews. Does that encourage you that it is possible to make progress in this role? Absolutely. I think uh, even the amount of work that Andrew's done so far with the, the interim guides and things has, I think, is bringing about some sort of culture change. As far as I can gather from speaking to SLE and TFA and these sort of bodies, they see that as a very positive thing and they do think they are recognising changes within their members in the way that they operate. Okay. So I think it does give hope that you know, we can move forward. Okay. Uh, Finlay Carson. Thanks, Ed. Good morning. Uh, you earlier mentioned about starter farms and your role with the, the, uh, in forestry. Uh, how, how would you measure how successful you are with starter farms and community woodlands, and how, uh, how is that part of your key objective in your new role? Well, I think starter farms is just one way that people can get a start on the farming ladder. I mean, in, in previous years, when the Forest Commission bought land, the house and the steading and a bit of good land round about it would have been sold on. So the idea was rather than selling it on, we would equip it and put someone in on a sort of 10-year tenancy, give them a start in the farming, maybe on a part-time basis, maybe full-time, and hope that they could build up expertise and capital so that at the end of 10 years they could move on to something a bit bigger. So I think it, it has a part to play uh, in helping to get new entrants into the business. So how, how many starter farms were actually created? It's, um, it's probably less than a dozen at the moment, but... Commission, I'm out of it now, but the Commission is still, I think, planning to hopefully acquire more land in the future, so I imagine we'll see more starter farms coming. Thank you. David Stewart has some questions now. Thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, good morning, Dr McIntosh. Could you outline for the Committee your key objectives and priorities for the post? Yep. I mean, some of my priorities are set down by the legislation, so I have to start with the codes of practice, the complaints procedure, um, I've been asked, the government asked, if the Tenant Farming Commission would carry out a specific investigation into the role of agents acting for landlords and tenants. So there'll have to be a gathering of evidence about that. There was obviously some disquiet expressed during the Ag Holdings review about um, the way the agents were sometimes, you know, not helping the landlord-tenant relationship. Clearly, many are very helpful in that role. Some clearly are not. So I have to carry out a, a review of their role. That will mean a call for evidence and a gathering of stuff and a publication of the results. So a number of things are prescribed already in terms of my initial priorities. But again, going back to it, I think it is about relationship building. It's about helping to try and change the culture uh, of how landlords, agents and tenants all interact with each other. And a lot of that I see happening through the codes of practice. Mm. Could I ask you then a question on the flip side of that? Um, what work will you not be carrying out? My experience in dealing in the Parliament with new organisations is sometimes you can have boundary wars with other organisations saying, no, no, this is my job. Um, clearly that is a potential. Yes. Um, what's, your th what's your thoughts to the committee on what you will not be clearly carrying out in your role and the wider role? Well, I certainly don't want to uh, cut across the role of the land court. Obviously that's one area. Uh, the whole crofting area, Obviously, there's the Crofting Commission. I don't see it as my role to cut across what they're doing. So I'd have to work, I want to work very closely with the Crofting Commission and, and the Land Commission. Mm. But I need to be very careful about not stepping on their toes. Mm. And it's obviously clearly, um, it's, it's not for your role to comment on the, the way the current legislation is framed, but is there a potential conflict in the legislation between your role and the Crofting Commissioner? Um, I don't think so. Um, I, the sort of work that I'd be doing on codes of practice and, and how landlords and, and tenants should interact with each other over rent reviews and things would have a relevance in the crofting sector, I think, where there are similarly landlord-tenant mm. relationships. But in terms of all the technicalities of crofting, I wouldn't dare tread into that sort of area. Mm. 
want to either. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can I just wrap this up, uh, Dr McIntosh, by just asking you a general question around what are your expectations of how time-consuming this role will be? Because it does strike me it will be extremely time-consuming. And are you ready for that? Well, it looks as if I'm going to be... Con <coughs> my contract, I think, is going to say something like six to eight days a month. But I fully expect that will not be enough. But on the other hand, the Commission will be recruiting staff over the next few weeks. And there will be staff within the Commission who, to support my role, now, we've still got to clarify that, so it's not absolutely clear what they might do and what I might do. So I will have support within the Commission, which will make it easier. Things like dealing with all the complaints procedures and things, I think there'll be somebody to do that. So I'm hoping I can spend a lot of my time interacting with tenants and farmers and landlords and, and the various organisations, rather than getting bogged down in the bureaucracy of it, as it were. OK. OK. Right, if all members are content. Um, thank you very much for your time. Uh, Dr McIntosh, um, I'm going to suspend briefly to allow a change of witnesses. Um, welcome back. Uh, we now have Bob McIntosh joined by the five Scottish Land Commissioner nominees. We have Professor David Adams, Lorne MacLeod, Megan McInnes, Dr Sally Reynolds and Andrew Thin. Welcome to all of you. Um, we, as you can imagine, have a number of questions for, we, for you and we'll begin with uh, Mark Roscoe. Um, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I want to start with a negative, but, but really to, to ask you, I mean, you, you know, you've got considerable strengths um, as individuals and as an entire commission, but what do you see as your, your weaknesses collectively and, and uh, how do you see how you might address those? You know, do you want me to, to, to lead and then pass it around, or how do yeah, you want us to do this? Mm. So that would be yeah. fine. Thank you, Mr. Thun. So uh, just an initial thought and then we'll just pass it out. Um, uh, I think it's a really strong team, uh, and I hope that shows on paper. The weakness clearly is that actually most of us only met each other last night. We've got to build, we've got to build a team, uh, and that you know there is an enormous difference between six well, well qualified, well experienced individuals and a really effective team. Um, so that's the weakness at the moment, and we're going to have to really work over the next two or three months so that by first of April it's fully functioning. Mm -hmm. Lorne might offer a few thoughts, given his experience of this sort of thing in other walks of life. In terms of the legislation, perhaps a, you know, a legal expertise is something that we maybe don't have particularly strong amongst us. But I think in terms of the recruitment of staff and uh, support mechanisms to undertake our work and specialisms in law, obviously there will be a variety of specialisms in law that will be needed. So I think that... Uh, level of expertise can be brought on to support what we do. But I, I do believe, as, as Andrew said, we met last night, uh, I do believe we have uh, a great breadth of experience according to the part uh, section 11, the, the list of uh, expertise that was required. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I mean, in terms of how the Commission will actually function, um, I mean, do you envisage having committees, subgroups? I mean, how would you actually marshal some of that wider expertise, such as legal expertise, that you'll need to bring in to supplement the expertise that you've got already? Have you got early thoughts around how you function and how you um, bring in extra expertise when, when and as is required? Given that we only met last night, you'll forgive us, I hope, for not having that thought fully thought yeah. through and crystallised as a team. Um, Clearly, we have the power and we hope, subject to the spending statement on the 15th, um, some resources to employ some people to, to help us. Clearly, we will have to structure that around an extremely strategic approach. There'll be, there is there's an enormous number of different things that we could do. Uh, 
we will have to come at this very systematically, and I, I would be very reluctant to offer you half-baked thoughts now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any other areas beyond legal expertise? What about planning, housing? You said, uh, maybe David could say a bit about yeah. planning and housing. I think we're reasonably well covered in terms of uh, a basic expertise in, in, in planning and housing. Um, I mean, I've been widely involved in, in, in debates with the professions and with stakeholders. Um, I think that obviously what we need to do is to ensure those debates continue and that uh, the key bodies are, are involved in developing the work. And I, I do think what is very important is that the work of the Commission should be seen as a Commission for Scotland as a whole and not just the rural parts of Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, so issues around planning and housing are very important for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's just tease that out a little bit and let's go around each of you in turn. I wonder if you could outline for us what you feel you personally bring to the Land Commission in terms of expertise and areas of interest. So let's we'll start with Megan McInnes. Thank you, convener, and good morning, everyone. Um, so firstly, I'd like to say um, I'm very excited about the chance to become a Land Commissioner and having met with the others last night, it's, it looks like it's going to be an, an excellent team with a huge amount of expertise and competencies. I think my personal contribution will be um, the, the, the years I've spent working on land reform and natural resource management and governance in Asia and internationally, as well as my background and family connections to the Highlands and to, to you know, the, the fact that I grew up on Sky and currently live, live in Applecross. Um, the work that that work in Asia and internationally has has let me get involved in a whole range of different elements of land reform, land management, from working with local communities on titling and um, recognition of collective land titles and land uh, land governance systems, to working with government and policy policymakers on legislative reforms, mm -hmm. as well as well as working with international agribusiness companies on how to balance the need between economic productivity and environmental and social protection. So I hope that those together give me a, a strong element of, of expertise in, to, to contribute to the Commission's work. Okay, thank you. Dr Sally Reynolds. Thank you. Um, I come from a personal background um, with regards to crofting and I professionally, personally work just now in a community owned estate. So I have professional and personal experience of community land ownership. In addition to that, I, um, my PhD was in environmental biology and I worked for a long time as an agricultural consultant, giving me a breadth of experience about land management, agriculture, environmental issues such as pollution, protected sites, and, and I hope that I can bring a breadth of experience in that way. I have a lot of experience um, working with communities, both professionally um, through working as a community owned estate, personally working as a common grazing clerk and involved in a number of local community organisations. I've also worked with SNH on the local Grey Lag Goose Management Scheme, which has given me a breadth of experience working with not only volunteers but also a government agency and taking that forward in a positive manner. And finally, I am a Gaelic speaker, so I will be able to add to the other benefits by communicating in Gaelic. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Professor Adams. Well, I guess my, my expertise is in uh, real estate and planning. I've done a lot of research into urban land ownership, uh, notice behaviours of landowners, looking at the house building industry, the development industry. Um, in that one of the key tasks of the Commission is, is, is to conduct, to oversee research. Uh, I was deputy chair of uh, the UK-wide panel that um, assessed the quality of research across all universities in the UK in architecture planning and built environment in 2014. So I have a lot of experience in terms of uh, research quality, research ethics, uh, research methods and so on and so forth. So hopefully that will uh, cross beyond my particular urban expertise. Okay. Uh, Lauren McLeod. I would hope I would be able to bring expertise in business and finance uh, in terms of uh, understanding of due diligence, of financial analysis, of putting fun financial structures together, uh, funding mechanisms. And I think uh, I've obviously had experience in private business as well uh, and also uh, involved for six years as a co-opted director of the Isle of Kia Heritage Trust and then six years in total with uh, Stara Suistje, 
which is uh, one of the larger buyouts, 93,000 acres, in which uh, we've been able to turn round a, 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 a landed estate and, and made it viable in terms of financially uh, structures and, and, and taking forward job creation, opportunities for capital development, harbour development uh, in terms of renewable energy. So I think all that, and in addition to that, obviously my involvement with Community Land Scotland, which has given me an experience of a wide range of communities and how they get involved with uh, land issues and around that. And I think a, a, another thing I would like to add to that is the importance of collaboration. And I think the protocol that we developed with uh, Scottish land and estates is very important to that, which offers opportunities for communities who wish to take forward the purchase of land, which isn't presently on the market. There is a step-by-step -step approach uh, to, to working on that. So I think collaboration in terms of the work of the Land Commission will be extremely important. Okay, Mr Mangtosh, at the risk of rehearsing what we went through earlier <laughs> briefly. <laughs> Well, I guess like, the main thing I would bring to the wider commission, I guess, is a lifetime's background and interest and involvement in land use and land management. I think that's what I bring principally, both at the sort of practical end and also at the sort of policy end, because in my last three years I was seconded into Scottish Government as the Environment and Forestry Director, so I was responsible for a lot of policy areas around land use, environment, forestry, etc. Okay. Andrew Thin. And there's real wealth of experience here, um, you know, from the from the international to the very specific. Um, what I what I hope I can will contribute is coordinating, pulling that together, facilitating so that all that talent is expressed in a way that's useful to the parliament, useful to the government. That would be number one. We we you know we must add value really effectively to the priorities of whoever is the elected administration of the day. Number two. I do have a lot of experience of, 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 of taking people with, with me in different roles that I've played, stakeholders, in the broadest sense of that term. Um, I know an awful lot of these people. I hope that that outward-facing contribution is my other co main, main add-on. In terms of interaction with the tenant farmer and commissioner, you've obviously been the interim. Um, do you feel you can assist Dr McIntosh in that role, or are you conscious as well that you need to allow him to get on with it? I, both. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope I will be able to assist if it's wanted, and I hope I'll be uh, able to shut up when it's not. <laughs> right. <laughs> Morris Golden. Uh, I think you're, uh, you're right to recognise that uh, collaboration is going to be key, but also um, there will need to be considerations around complaints and disputes. And uh, I would really just like to press you on um, an area where I feel it's still lacking based on what you've said, and that's around the, the requisite level of legal expertise that you can easily um, access. Now, obviously, you can uh, have you know, a firm on a retainer. You can try and bring that in-house. But for me, I think it would be quite difficult to, to square that circle. I'm just wondering your thoughts on that. I've got to offer a thought, and then I might um, see what others think. Um, the, the, the breadth of scope for this commission is such that the legal expertise we are quite likely to want is, at different points in time, will be quite specialised, and you'd never get it in one person. Um, my experience, for example, of tenant farming is that actually relatively few practising lawyers can really give you the advice you need on ag holdings. Mm -hmm. um, so. We, we should employ whatever we think we need in terms of general advice, but we will need to, to have the flexibility to buy that specialist input whenever we need it. It would be impossible, even with five or six people, to have all that specialist people on the Commission, and, and you wouldn't have any other doubt. Other However, what you have got on the Commission, and I, I was really delighted to pick this up last night, is that everybody around this table has engaged in legal issues one way or the other in, 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 at a level of, of, of detail that, that, that really encourages me. So I think you know, these people know how to talk to lawyers. It's probably a, the best way to put it. And they want to add to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. OK, thank you. Alexander Borman. Thank you. Um, just a, a question on the sort of agricultural experience. Um, do you think it's a concern, <coughs> yeah, whilst crofting is important, yeah, there are two representatives from uh, with crofting backgrounds on, on the commission, uh, but crofting only represents you know three percent of you know, Scotland's less than three percent of Scotland's agriculture. Do you think that's a bit of a concern that it's maybe too heavily focused on one particular sector? 
I don't think so. I, I, I mean, I don't think that anyone's here to represent anything. Uh, I think they're here because they have a diverse range of experiences, which happens to include... I mean, my experience includes crofting. It also includes ag holdings. It also includes... You know, I ran an enterprise company. Um, people bring to these things diverse experience, and that diversity uh, brings depth. I, I don't see it as a negative at all. You don't feel an absence of anybody with, you know, say, say beef or dairy or, or, or cereals, grain, any of that is an issue? Well, I think, I th I think we, have, we, we have experience around the table of, of, of the livestock sector. Uh, I take your point about arable, left direct, direct arable experience, but certainly in the livestock sector we have good experience. Okay. Um, Finley Carson. Just on, it, it, it does concern me that there appears to be an, uh, an overemphasis on the public sector. What is the experience of actually hands-on practical land management with regards to anything other than crofting across the, the Commission? With, with all due respect to, to Dr McIntosh, uh, there's a huge difference between weekend farming and day-to-day and -day land management when it comes to agriculture. I, I come from a, the area in the south of Scotland, and I'm worried that there's not the, the expertise or the experience on the panel other than from the, the, the crofting experience. Well, I'll speak for myself, and then, I mean, there is a lot of very good, robust private sector experience, but I was for several years director of an estate company that had a big farming operation. Uh, and, um, uh, so I have a very good handle on what, on the realities of running a commercial operation. Um, Lorne, you, you, you've been a director of the company. Well, in, in my involvement with the Isle of Gia Heritage Trust, there were four or five dairy farms on the island, so obviously some understanding like that, but I would accept that I don't have a practical hands-on experience, but from the experience of being on the board, looking at uh, reconstituting farms and trying to help them uh, become more viable, got experience there. Possible. Um, I do come from a crofting background and my hands-on livestock experience is with in a crofting scenario. I did work as an agricultural consultant where I worked with farmers and crofters. I wasn't only croft I didn't only deal with crofting. Um, and my involvement in states in estates has again been from a crofting. They are crofting estates, but I do deal with all sorts of things like commercial leases and so on and so forth. Uh, I do have some concern about relegating the Commission to being a farming organisation. The question could equally well be asked as why do we not have a house builder? Why do we not have someone from a financial institution on the Commission? I think it is, it is very important as the Commission goes forward, as I mentioned beforehand, um, that we do think about land across the whole of Scotland and not just land in, in, in rural areas. question uh, probably each of you could probably give me a bit of guidance on it is is that there's always two sides to every argument and 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 with land it becomes polarized uh, on, on each side and and I understand the need to to come up with codes of practice I just wonder wh whether it be on rural or, or housing what how you're going to sell yourselves to the agents who are trying to act on a commercial basis and have commercial guidelines uh, on returns that they need for their investment. So I just wondered if I could ask if it's all right with you, Camille, each of you, I don't know the order you want to go in, to explain how you think you're going to embed yourself with them because they're a critical part. Kick off, like, Scotland's a small place and you need to get out and talk to people and you need to engage and as you know Edward because you've seen me operate before that's how um, you know, I envisage all of us getting out and, and engaging with people you don't it's one of the real strengths of this country actually is that you can do that you can get out in a relatively short time if you put if you get off your backside and put the energy into it you can build those kinds of understandings which are two-way understandings very effectively I could say uh, a year ago I convened a meeting of land agents in Perth because I felt that there was a level of expertise amongst land agents that hadn't particularly been brought into the community landowning sector. And I think that was a particularly positive meeting and 
uh, in the intervening year, we've seen at least one firm of land agents which is now looking at creating a specialism to support community land owning sector. And I think it's this working in collaboration and working in a positive manner with groups uh, and bringing in all these expertise that uh, can be really conducive to us working very positively going forward. Um, I think I would just like to echo what Andrew said about the importance of stakeholder engagement with all the different stakeholders, the land, land agents and every other group which has a stakeholder or concern within the land sector in Scotland across the various different urban and rural communities. It is extremely important that we take time to talk to them. We, we get out of our offices and we go and actually see what's happening on the ground in all these different areas and take time as well to develop a strategic vision and a strategic plan for action over over the, the three or five year terms that we will we will be given, and um, and I think that that's it's only through doing that that we will we'll be able to ally everyone else's concerns that we are fully independent. We're not taking any particular groups uh, sides, and we want to maintain that independence throughout the, the remit of this commission and and set the groundwork for the future Scottish Land Commission as it moves forward. So just picking up on that point about your independence. Um, you're here today because you bring in an expertise in certain areas, but there is, some might say, a potential for conflict of interest to arise. We touched upon that earlier with Dr McIntosh. So I'd like to go around each of you in turn to, to ask you to reflect on whether you feel there are any areas of conflict of interest potentially in what you currently do with taking on the role of land commissioners and how you'll address those. So can I start with Professor Adams? There's no conflict of interest with my academic role because I'm encouraged to be as controversial as possible in that role. <laughs> so uh, my university is extremely happy to see me taking this role. I, I do have, uh, as in the papers, a, a, a role in, in, in convening a, a, a local community organisation. Uh, obviously, if there's any conflict of interest in that, it would be declared and I would absent myself from any discussion. Okay. Dr Reynolds. Thank you. I, um, I do work for a community-owned estate, and I have discussed it with them at length, and they've given their full support that they are more comfortable for me to be here, but in the same way as David, obviously, if there was ever a conflict, I would abstain myself. In, uh, in other areas, I don't see any conflict of interest, unless there was something to do with crofting that we were reviewing with common grazings. I would have to, because I am a common grazings clerk, so, but I don't envisage anything with that, but if there was, again, I would make sure that I absented myself from the discussions. Okay. Andrew Finn. I own a small amount of land that's not talented or anything else, uh, it will be fully declared. Um, I'm chairman of Scottish Canals, which owns land and big metal horses and various other things. Um, I don't think there's a direct, any conflict there, but, but I certainly will be fully declared and very, very alive to it. Okay. Bob McIntosh. I suppose the only thing I didn't mention earlier on is I am a fellow of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. Um, given that the whole uh, tenant farming thing revolves around landlord tenants and agents, I suppose there might be a sort of suggestion that, as a member of the RICS, I'm particularly hefty towards agents, and I am considering whether I keep my membership up for that very reason. Uh, I'm the chairman of Community Land Scotland, and it would be my intention, if I was confirmed in post, that I would resign from that role and my involvement with Community Land Scotland. The year end there is 31 December, so uh, take effect from that. I'm also a co-opted director of the community-owned estates for the islands of Eriski, South Uist and Benbecula, and I would also resign that role uh, from 31st December. Okay, thank you. Megan McInnes. Um, so, on a professional basis, I'm currently on maternity leave from the Organisation of Global Witness, and under that, that role, I had been involved in um, various elements of the Land Reform Act, particularly part, Parts 1 and Part 3. I've, I, have, I have been involved in uh, helping to work on submissions for the consultation processes which are underway following the enactment of that. So, I will need to, need to be discussing that with Global Witness and also with, the, with Andrew, the Chair, and with Bridget Campbell's team about any potential conflicts if I'm also confirmed in post. On a personal basis, my partner and his family are crofters in, Af in Upper Cross. So I, if there's any um, conflicts potentially moving forward there, I'll also uh, declare and abstain as necessary. Can, can I ask how in practice um, advice will be available to you on potential conflicts of interest? How's that going to work on the Commission? 
Uh, it was my responsibility to make sure the conflicts are managed well and managed properly, and I've done it many times in many public bodies, so that's the first line. Uh, the second line, we will always, uh, or I will always, if necessary, seek advice from sponsoring civil servants and, and if necessary, lawyers. I, I, I mean, I don't anticipate that, but, okay. but it should be about management. Okay, thank you for that. Finlay Carson. Uh, can I ask how many uh, of the, uh, the panel have currently or in the past had any formal ties with uh, CLS? Our commission. Community Land Scotland. Myself as chairman, obviously. The community group that I convene is a member of the Community Land Scotland. And the community group that I work for is also a member. And I am a personal member. Um, I've done a small amount of work with Community Land Scotland on the uh, potential, some background research on the land rights and responsibility statement. But that's, that's, a, con that's a contract with, which has been completed for a number of months now. Great, thank you. Um, as Professor Adams has identified, this is a commission for the whole of Scotland. So I'd like to each hear from each of you and how you envisage conducting your work um, across Scotland, geographically, sectorally, and engaging all the stakeholders um, with a stake in Scottish land. And we start um, with Megan McInnes. Well, as we've only just first met last night, we're only just beginning to think about exactly how we want to start doing that. I think all of us recognise that conducting that kind of stakeholder engagement at this initial process and also moving forward is, is one of the most important parts of the Commission's work. So it's extremely important that we get it right, that we reach out to the, all the different stakeholders and that we are able to demonstrate that we're, we're willing to listen, we're open and we're, we're, we're available for conversation with anyone who wants to come and talk to us um, as the Commission's strategic vision is developed and then as we actually start implementing the work as it's proposed on the 1st of April. Um, I think that as, as has also been clearly demonstrated, we're not, we're not representative of particular geographical areas or, or necessarily particular sectoral groups, but I think that together we all have very good uh, contacts and experience and knowledge of th these different areas and it's going to be about making sure that we have a plan that covers all the different sectoral, geographical and interest groups across Scotland to make sure that we do genuinely reflect land reform issues across the entire country. Thanks. And if I could just include, uh, I know you're to be based in Inverness, so again, thinking about you know, how you do make sure that you get out and about across the Highlands and across Scotland. Sorry. Uh, well, certainly with my involvement with Community Land Scotland, one of the exciting things at the moment is that the majority of inquiries are coming from out with the Highlands and Islands, particularly Dumfries and Galloway and the borders and also urban areas. So I've, I've had an involvement in, in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, in addition to that, uh, last week we had an awareness raising event in uh, Newton Stewart, which was filled to capacity. So I believe there is a growing awareness of issues. But I, I am conscious of the point that you made there. Uh, you know, there is an importance to bring this also to the urban areas. But successful projects going forward, like the, the community buyout of the Bermulloch Boxing Club, that's right in the heart of uh, uh, Glasgow. And I, and I think the importance of land and access to land for the for the entire uh, communities of Scotland and individuals is important and I think that's something that needs to be uh, at the forefront in taking forward work of Scottish Land Commission. Yes, totally agree. It's, uh, it's about everyone in Scotland and land is for all of Scotland and the urban area we, we, we mustn't ignore. Um, in my previous role in the Forest Commission we started an urban forestry agenda and we actually got involved in managing and creating woodlands in the heart of some of the most disadvantaged parts of Glasgow and things and that was a hugely rewarding experience which I think had a very positive impact on communities and the landscape in the urban area so certainly not our intention I think to ignore the urban dimension in this. This is not unique to this uh, public organisation. The majority of public bodies need to be fully serving the, the all of Scotland's people that's what they're there for so, so this is not unique. In my experience there's two key dimensions Apologies for keeping a principled approach, but we haven't got the talk through the practice. First of all, you have to get the culture and core values right 
from day one. We must establish the right culture, the right core values, transparency, accessibility, all these sorts of things, so that, so that we can be there for everybody. And then secondly, you have to get management practice right. So, you, you know, the board needs to get out, the staff need to get out. Um, you, uh, when, when you conduct a review, you need to have a systematic uh, uh, evidence gathering process that's properly inclusive, that uses social media and all these sorts of things. So those, those two dimensions of what we have to think through, but we haven't thought it through yet. I would agree with everything my colleagues have already said. Um, and we did only meet yesterday, so we haven't managed to start planning this yet. But I would hope that, or I would assume we will have a strategic and methodical plan to get out there and see everyone. I'm a very, very big believer in community engagement and communication, and I'm a very big believer in talking and going out and meeting people face to face and speaking with as many stakeholders as possible and ensuring that we meet as many people across the whole of Scotland and every sector. I would hope that the Commission will have a very strong focus on the huge extent of vacancy and dereliction. Uh, it's 12,500 hectares in Scotland. It's really not been tackled for a long period of time. That's more than twice the size of the city of Dundee. We have um, a long-standing problem. It's concentrated in cities. It's not exclusive in cities. It particularly affects the most deprived communities. It is a scourge on the economic sustainability of Scotland that we waste so much resource that is vacant and derelict. I think the Commission has to begin to understand why that is the case. It has to understand why redevelopment projects, why development projects take so long. It has to understand the role of land in housing and in urban areas. And it must really tackle some of these issues that are core uh, as much, I think, to the economic prosperity of Scotland as a whole uh, as to environmental sustainability. Now, in some cases, that is concentrated in urban areas, but some of these derelict sites are, 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 are in quite peripheral rural locations. So I think we need to get away, as I say, from urban and rural, and we need to look at themes. And the theme of trying to reduce, trying to tackle this huge backlog that we have of vacancy and dereliction, to me, is an important part of the Commission's work. Okay, thank you. Um, at this stage, it might be useful just to tease something else out um, on the record. Can you each confirm the period of your appointments? Because as I understand it, they're staggered. Um, I'm not sure if we can. I'm not sure who's... Because it's not confirmed, we haven't got formal offers. Oh, ah, right, OK. <laughs> so, so there's nothing determined at the moment. But in terms well, of the... Well, no, you, I don't think the government can give us a formal offer till, till you've considered whether you wish to confirm. Right, OK. OK, it's simply that the Act um, provides as a provision for uh, staggered appointments up yeah. to a maximum of five years. And the idea was not to get to the point five years from now where the entire Land Commission was up for uh, okay. change. I can confirm, uh, I've had a conversation with civil servants and it is the intention to stagger, that, to, to, to make sure there is a stagger, yeah. Right, so that yeah. will happen, you just don't yes. know yet because of where we are in the process. Yeah. Right, okay, thank you for that. Uh, Jenny Goldruth. Convener. Um, in terms of strategic planning, um, you've all spoken to some extent about the importance of relationship building. But obviously uh, the Commission will be time limited because the 1st of April is when it's all meant to kick off. So in the intervening um, months, how do you proceed um, together? What are your plans? I suppose I know, Andrew Thin, you, you say you've only met last night for the first time, but how do you envisage going forward in terms of strategic planning? And how will you do exactly as Dr Reynolds uh, spoke about previously, reach out to those communities and involve them in that strategic planning process? Let me offer some starters. So that over the next three to four months, we, we need to get in place um, a, a strategic plan just for that first year, for 17-18, for mm -hmm. and a business plan for 17-18. So, so we're not going to, to get everything clarified by the 1st of April. What, probably the top priority in that first year will be, will, will be as, as is set out in the Act, will be to produce a, a three-year strategic plan, I'm guessing three years. Um, so I don't, I don't think all of this is going to happen between, between now and 31st March. In order to make that happen effectively, um, as I've suggested earlier, there is, um, 
th there will have to be formal, structured ways of consulting and engaging. Mm -hmm. um, but the, but I am also extremely anxious that even in even in the the pre-April period, that we find ways as as a team of engaging with the key players. Now that's going to be quite tough. It's only three months, three four months, and mm -hmm. there's Christmas in the way. But I think it can be done with the key players. Um, so that the human relationships start to build, because f for me, a lot of this is going to be about taking advantage of being in a small country to build those those human relationships very early. Jenny Gould. Has anyone else any thoughts in terms of how you do engage the community with the work that you're doing more broadly in that strategic plan? I appreciate that there is a time limit and that perhaps it won't be ready to go by the 1st of April, but do you have any thoughts more broadly about how you engage different stakeholders in that process? Well, <clears throat> sorry, one of the things we, we all discussed last night was the importance of, of communication. And the commission, you know, establishing a communication plan and, and, a, and a strategy, both for listening but also for informing and being transparent. So I think that that's also something that we've identified as a key priority mm -hmm. that will start before the first of April, so that people get to know who we are, why we are excited, what do we have to offer, and that the, the, the means of, of that dialogue initiating with groups across Scotland can 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 start already, mm -hmm. um, not, not just in terms of us going out and, and visiting different stakeholders visiting different stakeholder groups, but also more uh, sort of social media-based communications yeah. as well. It's, mm -hmm. it's extremely important given how much Twitter it plays a role now in terms of these, the, you know, the, 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 the online discussions. Yeah. cross has got a supplementary question. Um, I thought there were some very interesting points there by Professor Adams about effectively placemaking, um, not just within an urban context, but an urban-rural context as well, and the role of vacant derelict land. But it got me thinking about the, the remit of, of you as a commission and where you draw the line in terms of what's within your remit, what's outside of your remit. So, I mean, perhaps I could ask Professor Adams to perhaps explain where he sees that line and where, where he would see uh, his, the agenda of the, of the Commission trans, you know, relating to other bodies which perhaps feel that they've got more of a, more of a locus and a role there. He was just to make a comment on it after Professor Adams. I find that a very difficult question because I don't work in lines or boxes. I just make connections all over the place. Um, and I have talked uh, about land reform to groups from the Scottish Property Federation, the RICS, through to community housing associations and so on and so forth. So I think um, part of this is actually just seeing where we go. Um, and one of the key things about land is is it's such an integrating resource it does pull together a whole series uh, of potentials um, so i'm not too sure how to answer the question because it's not in my in, in my nature of thinking to draw too many lines and too many boxes um, i realize that in terms of the organization we we, we clearly will we, we'll have to not tread on the people's toes but no doubt no doubt we'll find a way of dealing with that mm. So it could cross over into local government reform, for example. I hadn't, I, I hadn't thought that, that thought that that was something be top priority. I mean, it might cross over into planning reform, mm. um, because I think that one of the issues around um, planning reform is the extent to which it doesn't make enough connections with land. Um, how we actually deal with that. Uh, we, 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 no doubt we will find out, but, but I think the beauty of being an independent position, commission and the beauty of starting almost from scratch is, is that you, you, you actually try to think quite imaginatively and then if you find lines and boxes, well, well let's deal with them there. I wouldn't start with them. If we, think about, if we think about our job as being to help this parliament and this government achieve its priorities in relation to land policy, land legislation, um, that starts to, to put a frame around this. We've got the national performance framework and that will be revised and so on. So I think we will build, we, we will build you know, our, our job, ultimately this is about helping the Scottish people through the parliament achieve, achieve, the, achieve what, the, what the Scottish people want, want to achieve. And it's, it's delineated to some extent by legislation. But we will build from that a, a, a corporate plan, a three-year strategy and all the rest of it, and we will consult very widely on that. And, and 
uh, it, it will ultimately be laid before Parliament as part of the process. So I, I, th I, think, I think the mechanisms are all there to make sure that this is sensibly coordinated with the work of civil servants, the work of other public bodies. We have to be very careful not to be tempted and indeed perhaps pushed to go into this and that and that because it looks interesting and fun and exciting. We need to be very systematic and we need to constantly remind ourselves that our job is to help the parliament, help the elected representatives of the country to deliver what those representatives consider to be the priorities, which at the moment are sustainable economic development, inclusion and so on. Okay. Dave uh, Stewart. Yeah, thank you, Peter. My are to Andrew Thin as the prospective chair. Clearly, there's a heavier responsibility, Andrew, on you, um, where obviously issues like leadership and vision are vitally important. Could you describe your leadership style? And secondly, what is your overall vision for the organisation? Um, my, my leadership... <laughs> my <laughs> Well, my leadership style, I mean, it, it, is, it is an inclusive, it's a team-based leadership style. Um, uh, but it is a leadership style from the front, I, um, and some people like that and some people don't. But uh, that is the nature of uh, the, the, the way I lead, and, and I think most people here have seen me lead in different roles, so, so you know how I do it. Um, do I have a vision? Yes, I think I started to articulate it just now in response to Mr. Ruskell. Um, I, I, I think this organisation has the potential to help this parliament and the government of the day deliver whatever its priorities are, and those priorities will change from time to time mm. with elections and all the rest of it. The potential is there to have a specialist body that's saying, right, your priority is, uh, you know, a, a country that's more at ease of itself, for example, a more inclusive economy or a growing economy or whatever it is. Mm. Well, if you did this in relation to, to, to planning or derelict land or, or, or whatever, that might help you deliver your priorities. So my vision is very much about a, an organisation that is um, really adding value uh, to, 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 to what the government is trying to do. And in the process of that, exciting and energising the people of Scotland to think about these issues and think, um, to think the unthinkable, perhaps that's a bit strong, but, but I think a lot of us don't think about land. We take, we take our current approach to land as, as red. And part of our job will be to, um, to energise that thinking process, which, which should lead to a more effective uh, democracy and a more effective government. Thank you. My, um, my, my colleague Jenny Gilruth mentioned earlier about the issue towards developing the strategic plan. Um, uh, I think if I mis misquote Napoleon, he talked about strategy disappears with the first contact with the enemy. I'm not suggesting you will have any enemies, but you take the point that it's fairly easy to do a strategic document in an ivy tower and then find that that doesn't meet reality. What, what, how would you respond to that? No, I, absolutely. And I also think the, it's, it's partly that it disappears uh, because you haven't thought things through properly in consultation with other people, but it's also that lots and lots of people will be coming in and telling us we ought, what we ought to be doing this on this, that, and the next thing. And, and it's extremely easy to become uh, blown by the wind rather than strategic so I think both those both those mm. risks are there we we uh, I don't I'm not going to repeat all the things that have been said but but we were very clear in our conversation last night that we are not going to just jump in at the first thing that takes our fancy that we were going to work through this quite systematically we will produce by the 31st of March a clear strategic approach to that first year um, and we will during the course of that, uh, that first year, produce a proper strategic plan for the next three years, and we'll do it very systematically. And my final question, convener, is, is over conflict, to use your analogy earlier about plain sailing. It's sometimes easy to manage in plain sailing, but when there's a tidal wave, it's much more difficult. How would you deal with a situation where you've got poor performance from commissioners? Uh, would you be responsible for annual appraisals? Um, and how would you remedy uh, poor performance? In all the public bodies that I have chaired, I have introduced something called 360 degree appraisal for board members, or in this instance, commissioners, but it's the same thing. Uh, I would intend, I haven't asked these guys if they'll agree to it, but I hope they will. <laughs> I would intend to introduce really robust 300, 360 degree, for, in case you haven't come across it, is a form of appraisal mm -hmm. where the people working around you, and I'm including your employees as well as the fellow board members, uh, and possibly even uh, outside stakeholders um, are invited 
to tell you what you're doing well and what you could perhaps think better, mm. uh, do better. Mm. And I, I will. I, I'm very anxious that we have a really robust system. Uh, and uh, at the risk of stretching things a wee bit, I think that's something that should be in all public bodies in Scotland. But, and I think I said finally earlier, but finally, finally, um, do you see yourself as having a clear management role um, over the other commissioners, or are you first man equals? Because as you know from other bodies, which I know you've had lots of experience of, sometimes there has been a bit of real confusion over what the role of the chair is. No, this is a team. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not a, 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 I'm not managing people, but I hope I, I can offer um, some sort of leadership and coordination and inspiration. But this is getting the most... I hope you've heard... Um, that you've got extraordinary talent sitting around here. And my job is to get that talent out mm -hmm. and build synergy. Thank you. Edward Mountain. Uh, just a, a small question, if I may, to Andrew Thin. It, it, it's that I, I know you from the past, and I was wondering if you'd thought about which, which, which you will have done about the size of the team that you will need to support the team that, that you currently have around you. There is provision for a chief executive. I wondered if you'd had any idea how lean the rest of the uh, department will be? Um, very early days, but we did touch on this last night. I think, um, first of all, we don't know what resource the Parliament will wish to make available to us, so, so I, I, you know, I have to put that proviso in there. Um, I think we'll be very anxious to keep fixed costs as low as possible, um, because who knows what the next 5, 10, 15 years are going to bring in terms of public expenditure so we want to keep fixed costs down to so it'll be quite a lean tight team um, what we would like to do is have uh, sufficient slack in there so that variable costs will allow us to bring in the kind of specialisms that we referred to for example specialist legal support um, for particular bits of work so we can do it that way so that's the way I see it so we can we can expect a, a lean team um, with, with support being brought in where required is what you're saying yes low fixed costs with enough slack to, 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 do, to use. I'm glad we've tied you down that, on that, Andrew. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think we've covered most of the areas we would want to cover, but perhaps I could wrap this up by asking each of you a question. You obviously come to this role with ideas and ambitions for what the Land Commission will deliver. Can I ask you what success would look like three years or five years from now for each of you? Megan McInnes. I was asked this uh, exact same question during the interview. <laughs> um, I think that if we think about, if we, if we talk about having a three-year three -year strategic plan being developed within the first year, within that, within that time frame, I think it's, it's most important that the Commission has demonstrated itself, as a, it's, has demonstrated that it is, it is a legitimate organisation and it's successfully and effectively contributing to the thinking around the land issues in Scotland across all the different sectors, urban, rural, um, whether you're coming from an, an agriculture or a, a crofting or a forestry or urban housing, all of these different sectors need to be reflected within that, within our work. I think we need to demonstrate that we are communicating effectively, that we are listening to all the different stakeholder groups and that we are, we are thinking about their ideas and responding and being transparent about that. So for, for me, those are the most important elements of, of where we want to be in, in, within that first three-year plan. Or well, in my experience, you know, land and access to land is an issue which is absolutely crucial for individuals and communities you know, maxim maximising their own potential. Um, so I would like to see that we, you know, look at all the levers that can help facilitate that and we look throughout the whole of Scotland, particularly to those areas that, uh, in, in urban areas, that maybe haven't had the, the level of awareness of the the potential that can come from land and access to land, and I think we, that would be my uh, objective for success. Bob McIntosh. Well, in relation to the TFC role, I guess, a um, number of successes. One would be that the, the landlord relationship is a lot more comfortable across Scotland than it sometimes is at the moment. Perhaps the amount of land available for tenanting would start to increase again rather than decrease. And I guess another measure of success would be if, if all the codes of practice and the culture change is working, then the number of cases going to land court should diminish. So nothing very ambitious there. No, no, nothing. No. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ali Reynolds. I would like us to have a, a very clear and strategic plan going forward, and I would like us to be able to look back after three years, be able to review that, see where we've come from and where we're going. And I would like to feel that we, by that time we'd have built up really good relationship with stakeholders and have good stakeholder confidence in what we are doing as a commission. 
And the key for me in that is always communication, and that's honest, clear communication. Professor Adams. I think what we need to do is to have, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a clear, rigorous, a dispassionate understanding of what really are the land problems of Scotland to open up that debate with thorough analysis, thorough uh, investigation. And I would hope that by doing that, it is then possible to, to chart, either within the Commission or within government, um, far more successful land policies in Scotland in the future than perhaps we've had in the past. OK, thank you. And finally, Andrew Thurna. Two things. Um, first of all, the Scottish people through this parliament being very clear that it has got, uh, that it has created in this organisation uh, something that is exciting, dynamic, and that really adds value to, to, to the leadership of this country. And secondly, that Scotland and the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament are perceived on at least a European stage, if not beyond, as being right at the front of land reform on an international level. Okay, thank you. Right, uh, can I thank you for your attendance today? Um, the next meeting of the committee is on the 6th of December when it will take evidence from the Chair and the Chief Executive of Scottish Water and the Chief Executive of Business Stream on Scottish Water's Annual Report 2015-16. The committee will also consider its draft report on the appointment of the Scottish Wine Commissioners and the Tenant Farming Commissioner. As agreed earlier, we will now move into the private session. I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed. Thank you. <laughs>